God is good and all the time. Amen. Amen. Are we blessed to be in the presence of God today? No, today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 10, not the book of John. Amen. Acts chapter 10, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 20. Please turn in your Bibles. We're reading the story of Cornelius and Peter. Cornelius sends a delegation. Um, if you're there, if you have your Bible, please turn there. If, if you don't, um, it's on the screen. But please follow along in your Bibles if you can as we look to the Word of God. Amen. I'm going to start from verse 1. I'm going to start from verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, the devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent to where? To Joppa. Verse 9, the next day as they were on their way, as they went on their way and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet, a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill, and what? Eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Another translation says, no, Lord. And I don't know about you, but there's just something that doesn't sit right with that combination of words. No, Lord. For I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call uncommon. What God has cleansed, you must not call uncommon. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the man who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them arise go therefore go down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them this morning for just a few minutes by god's grace we want to discuss the topic breaking down our prejudice breaking down our prejudice let us pray father we come this morning with hearts open to you tender before you we ask holy spirit you've been with us since the beginning of this service we've worshiped you we've welcomed your presence now our ears are attentive to what you have to say and so like Samuel, we say this morning, speak, Lord, for your servants are hearing. Blessed be your name, O God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. The story is told of a middle-aged man who was distraught 
over his wife's stubborn refusal to accept that she had a hearing problem. One day, this man went to the family doctor and asked for his advice on how to convince his wife that she had a problem. The doctor promptly told him that when he got home, he was to confirm the problem by standing at the front door and from there asking his wife what's for dinner. The doctor then said, if she doesn't respond, move a bit closer and repeat the question. And if she still doesn't respond, then move right to her ear and whisper in her ear, what's for dinner, honey? And so the man races home with joy in his heart and he stands at the front door and he asks his wife, what's for dinner? When there was no reply, he moved a bit closer and asked again, what's for dinner, honey? No reply. And so he looks into the quick kitchen and sure enough, there was his wife. And so following the doctor's instructions, he tiptoes to his wife and he whispers gently in her ear, what's for dinner, honey? Immediately, the wife turned and looked at him. Like I said, the previous two times, we are having spaghetti for dinner. <laughs> you know, it's part of our fallen nature to um, justify ourselves, thank you, Ma, and condemn others. Um, either because we think we're superior to them or because um, they're different from us. But today we want to look just for a few moments at the story of Peter and Cornelius um, and learn certain lessons of what the Holy Spirit would tell us from this story. The Bible tells us that Cornelius is a devout man, right? Right? Can we put the verses on the screen again? Verse 1. Let's just walk through this story from verse 1. The Bible tells us Cornelius is a devout man. He fears the Lord, the Bible tells us. A certain man in Caesarea, he's devout. He fears the Lord. Um, the Bible tells us that he gives alms generously to the people. And he prayed to God always. Impressive resume. But despite that resume, there was something missing. Because an angel appears to him and tells him to send, tells him first of all that his good deeds, right? Let's look at it together. After Cornelius is afraid and asks, what is it, Lord? The angel says to him, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. They've come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon. So something is missing. This man is, has good works. This man fears God. He's a Roman, but unlike other Romans, he doesn't believe in a polythe or in polytheistic gods. He, he, he's come to realize that there is one God. The Bible tells us he fears God. He's devout. He fears God. He prays regularly. He gives alms to the poor. But there's something missing. There's something missing. And so the angel says, despite all of that, despite your good works, despite your, your belief in God, you've, you, 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 you've put aside a belief in multiple gods and worshiping multiple gods like the culture in which you were brought up. But there's something missing. And that thing that is missing is 
Faith in who? Jesus. Faith in Jesus. And so the angel says, send men to Joppa. Caesarea is about 30 miles north of Joppa. Send men to Joppa and ask for a man called Simon, surnamed Peter. And he will tell you what you must do. He will tell you what you must do. And so the angel leaves. Cornelius calls two of his household servants. In verse 7, he, he adds a devout soldier, so three of them. And he explained all these things to them, and he sent them to Joppa. Sent them to Joppa. <laughs> now, as, he, as these men depart Joppa, excuse me, there's a problem. Right? Who knows what the problem is? Right in that moment of time, the men are heading to Joppa. There's a problem. What's the problem? Peter is not ready to receive them. Right? Peter is not ready to receive them. In fact, Peter explains to us um, in verse 28, which we didn't read. We'll read that later. But first of all, Peter is prejudiced. These men are heading towards him and he's got prejudice, a certain prejudice in his heart. He's a devout Jew. He believes that Jews, that it's unlawful for a Jew to keep the company of a Gentile. Verse 28, let's read that together. Then he said to them, this is Peter now speaking to Cornelius and his household. He said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter has a problem. There's a problem. Peter's prejudiced. And before we go any further, I think we should define what prejudice means. What is prejudice? What does prejudice mean? The American Heritage Dictionary defines prejudice as an adverse judgment or opinion that is formed beforehand or without knowledge. An adverse judgment or opinion formed beforehand or without knowledge or examination of the facts. A preconceived preference or idea, a bias. The second definition is the act or state of holding unreasonable preconceived judgments or convictions. It's an irrational suspicion or hatred of a particular group race or religion or class or culture it's a detriment or injury caused to a person by the preconceived and unfavorable conviction of another or of others but to that we can add another definition from a godly perspective to be prejudiced is a preconceived notion that is at odds with the gospel The gospel of Jesus. And the first point we want to deal with today is with our acceptance of the reality of prejudice. Because it's easy for us to, it's easy for us to think that prejudice is an abstract concept. Yes, there's prejudice out there. Yes, I've been a victim of prejudice. And all of that is true. But our first point today is this, that no one is immune to being prejudiced. No one. I'm not immune to being prejudiced. And you're not immune to being prejudiced. No one is immune to being prejudiced. None of us is immune. Because in the story of Peter, we see a born again, Spirit-filled believer who is serving God. Amen. But yet, he what? He has prejudice in his heart. And Peter is not just a disciple. Peter is not just someone that's been called to serve God. Peter has, Peter has been specially commissioned by Jesus himself. 
Peter is a pillar in the church, in the early church. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16 together. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter has been specially commissioned by Jesus. Jesus says, I give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Let me ask you this. What do you do with a key? What do we do with keys? Anybody? Amen. A key can be used to unlock a door or to what? Lock a door. Amen. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Peter has been specially commissioned by Jesus. And it is as if Jesus is saying to him, by that phrase, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter, I will use you to unlock doors to the kingdom of heaven. I will use you to unlock doors to the kingdom of heaven. So no surprise then that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He rises up and preaches and 3,000 men are saved. God is using him through the Holy Spirit to unlock doors to the kingdom of heaven. But he's not immune to being prejudiced. No one is immune. No one is immune. To being prejudiced. It's the same Peter when Philip goes down because of persecution against the early church in, in Samaria. The Bible tells us the disciples left Jerusalem. Philip goes down to Samaria. God, God through the Holy Spirit is doing mighty works through Philip. People are being miracles, signs and wonders. There is great joy in the city. The scriptures tell us. And then the disciples hear of it in Jerusalem. And who do they send? They send Peter and John. And Peter and John go and they lay hands on these believers that have believed in Jesus and they receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, God is using him to unlock doors, not only in Jerusalem, but now in Samaria. God is using Peter to unlock doors to the kingdom of heaven. And yet he is not immune to being prejudiced. Brothers and sisters, no one is immune. No one is immune and God wants to use Peter to unlock one more door, to open one more door, the door to the Gentiles. And now God has to deal with his what? Prejudice. God has to deal with his prejudice. No one is immune. No one is immune. No one is immune from prejudice. No one is immune in any generation as it was in the early church. Even so in our generation. Even so in this generation of Christianity. We are called to confront our prejudice because we all come from different traditions. And in a multicultural and multiracial world, we are called to preserve the unity of the spirit despite our differences. Amen. Amen. We are called to preserve the unity. Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3. Make every effort, he says, to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Make every effort. Make every effort. Make every effort to keep yourselves united, to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. And so if no one is immune to being prejudiced, the question for us this morning is what are the prejudices that I need to confront in my life? What are the prejudices that I need to, be conf that I need to confront excuse me, in my life? Because you can be prejudiced against people. I can be prejudiced against people because of their race, because of their color, or because of their creed. I can be prejudiced to someone because, simply because I feel superior to them. And so the question for me, the question for us is, Lord, what are the prejudices that I need to confront? What are the prejudices that I need to confront? Because the first step to breaking down our prejudice is accepting that we are prone to being prejudiced. 
Amen. And once we've accepted that, then the next question, our second point today is this. God must break down our prejudice if we're going to be effective in his kingdom. Amen. We saw that, right? God is using Peter to unlock doors to the kingdom, but it gets to a third door. And now God has to deal with that prejudice. If Peter is going to continue to be effective, if Peter is going to continue to be used by God, if Peter is going to be a key that God will use to unlock doors in his kingdom, God must deal. God must deal. God must deal with our prejudices. Amen. God must deal with our prejudices because it is okay for us to come to God as we are, but we cannot leave the same way we came. Amen. So God must deal with our prejudices. He must work on our hearts. He must work on our hearts. He must work on our hearts to take away our prejudices. Let's continue with our story. So these three men now have left Joppa and they're heading towards Peter who regards them as unclean, who thinks, who believes it is forbidden to interact with them. They're on their way to Joppa. They're on the way, they're on the way to Peter. Now notice it appears to me that Peter does not know that he has a prejudice. It appears to me that Peter believes he's standing on solid ground. I mean, he's quoting the law. Amen. He's quoting instructions from God. Amen. And he believes he's standing on solid ground. And except for the intervention of the Holy Spirit, we may never know our prejudices. We can be blind to our prejudices. And that's our second point. God must deal with our prejudices. Amen. Amen. And we must be humble enough to pray, Lord, reveal the prejudices in my heart. Peter could have quoted the law, God's instructions, and felt justified that he was on solid ground. But we see that God had to prepare Peter's heart. God had to prepare Peter's heart. The next day, they were on their way to Joppa. On their, on their journey, they drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray. And about the sixth hour, he became, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound. And he sees this vision and, 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 and a voice tells him, there's four-footed animals in the, in the sheet. And the voice says, rise, Peter, kill, eat, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. For I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Peter is sincere. He's wrong, but he's sincere. He's, I mean, Lord, I, you gave these laws and I'm following these laws. I have never eaten anything unclean or common. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call uncommon. God had to reveal the prejudice in Peter's heart. Literally, as the men are approaching Simon, right? That's what the Bible tells us. Did you catch that? As they went and drew near the city, then Peter goes up. So God is working on his heart. Literally, these men are approaching him, and God begins to work on his heart. God begins to work on his heart. Thank you, Matt, to break down those prejudices. God gives Peter a vision of animals that the Jews regarded as, as unclean because of the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. And look at all God does. Peter goes up to pray. By the way, it's interesting that both Peter and Cornelius were doing the same thing. What were they doing? They were praying. Amen. Amen. They were both praying. And in the place of prayer, God meets them. God speaks to them. God intervenes. God changes them. God instructs them. God guides them. God brings salvation. But look at where it starts. In the place of prayer. What am I trying to say? Brethren, let us not grow weary in the place of what? Prayer. Amen. Let us not grow slack in the place of what? Prayer. Amen. 
Let prayer not become boring to us. Amen. Let prayer not seem like, oh, something I have to do. Both personal prayer and corporate prayer. Let us be fervent in the place of prayer. Because in the place of prayer, God met Cornelius. God met Peter. And if we are fervent in the place of prayer, God will meet us. Amen. Let us not be slack in the place of prayer, brothers and sisters. But let's continue. Peter goes up to pray. And as he's praying, he gets hungry. I mean, look at how God just orchestrates everything. He gets hungry. And then he falls into a trance. And God lets, uh, a sheet is let down. And God uses the very thing that he needs and says, Peter, rise, kill and eat. Look at the orchestration. Right as the men are approaching, because by the time we get to the end of the story, Peter's come out of the trance and he's wandering. And then the Bible tells us that they're at the door. I mean, so look at the timing. Look at the timing. But God is dealing with his prejudice. Look at the timing and the orchestration for Peter to get hungry in the place of prayer. They're making food. He falls into a trance, receives a message. And it's interesting that that message is repeated three times. We'll talk about that later on the third point. But what are we trying to say? God must deal with prejudice in our heart. And, and he will if we, allow him, if we allow him and if we're sensitive to him. Amen. He receives this vision and this trance. Says, no, Lord. And God says, and the voice says, when God has cleansed, what God has cleansed, excuse me, you must not call and come. And in other words, with the coming of Jesus into the world and with the final cleansing, sacrifice of Christ now offered, the old ceremonial laws about food and are lifted and the door of the kingdom of God was open to the Gentiles. God had moved on. But Peter was still stuck in the ceremonial law. But when we're sensitive to the Spirit, amen, when we're listening to God, amen, when we're sincere, even if we are wrong, God can meet us, amen, God can meet us, God can move, God can direct, God can guide us, God can guide us, God can lead us. But the main point we want to say in the second point is this, God is the one at work. God is the one at work. He's the one at work. Yes, we're not immune to it, but God is the one at work exposing the hidden sin of prejudice in the heart of Peter. And only he can do the same in our hearts. And he does this. Why? So that we can be effective in our service for him. The vision ends. Peter is wondering, what could this possibly mean? Right? The Bible tells us he's pondering it. He's wondering in his heart. He's wondering in his heart. And then there's a knock on the door. And the vision, excuse me, verse 16 tells us the vision about unclean animals happened three times. Verse 19 tells us that there were three men at the door. And I don't believe that's an accident. But he's shown the vision three times and there's three men at the door. And the Holy Spirit tells Peter, three men are looking for you. Arise and go with them. Doubting nothing. Doubting nothing. The fact that God tells us that he is, the fact that the Holy Spirit tells him doubting nothing, I think is a clue to us that Peter has doubts. Going with this man is, is a doughty proposition. Is there a word called doughty? I don't know. Doubting proposition. Amen. But for us to be effective in serving God, he must first break down our prejudices because where there is prejudice, there are walls. There are divisions and the love of God is not manifest. We can't be effective for God. When there's walls and divisions and God's love is not manifest. Listen to these verses, Ephesians 2 verse 14. For Christ himself has brought what? Peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. John 13 verse 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus has broken down. He is our peace. He has broken down the wall of hostility that separated us. I pray today, I pray today that God will break down every wall of prejudice. 
every prejudice that creates walls of division, hostility, or distrust in our congregation, I pray that God will break them down today in Jesus' name. That God will break down walls of hostility, walls of division, walls of distrust. We all have a tendency to group people, and then we pigeonhole individuals and judge them because they belong to the group. Peter easily could have thought centurions are Roman soldiers and are wicked, sensual, worldly pagans. He would have badly misjudged Cornelius. Cornelius could have thought, I'm supposed to learn from an uneducated Jewish man who is stained with a tanner? He's probably never been outside of Palestine. What could, I, what could he possibly teach a well-traveled Roman like me? And he would have missed it. He would have missed God's blessings. May the Lord help us all in Jesus' name. So no one is immune to being prejudiced. God must deal with the prejudice in our heart. But our final point today is this. When God confronts our prejudice, we must yield in obedience to him. Amen. Yes, God deals with prejudice. Sometimes God alerts our minds to prejudices that we're blindsided by. But when God does that, when he reveals the prejudice in my heart, I must respond in obedience. Amen. It's important to respond in obedience when God reveals prejudice in our hearts, to acknowledge that we are prone to prejudice, understand that we, are not, we may not even be aware excuse me, of our prejudices, and we need God to reveal them to us. But most importantly, how do we respond? How do we respond when the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart? How do we respond? It's interesting that the vision was shown three times. Three times, the Bible tells us. Three times Peter sees, sees this vision. So apparently, three times the sheet came down to Peter. Three times he was told to take the formerly unclean animals and kill them. And three times Peter resisted. Three times. Take, rise, kill, and eat. No, Lord. Not so, Lord. Three times. Which means that in the vision, Peter never did kill and eat. He never did kill and eat of the animals as he was told to. But thank God for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Look at verse 17. While Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant. The men came and made an inquiry. They called and asked, is there somebody, Simon Peter, lodging here? While Peter thought about the vision, thank God for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit said to him, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Without the voice of the Spirit, Peter possibly would not have gone with those men. He resisted three times in the vision. But the Spirit said to him, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing. Doubting nothing. Peter could have been suspicious. Peter could have stood on the ceremonial laws. But thank God for the voice of the Spirit. Go down with them, doubting nothing. Go down with them, doubting nothing. Go down with them, doubting nothing. Get up. In the New Living Translation, I think it says, get up, go downstairs, and go with, the, go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. For the Spirit to say, don't worry, Peter was worried. Is that a fair conclusion? For the Spirit to say, uh, um, don't hesitate, Peter would have had some hesitation. Is that fair? But the Spirit says, go, go with them, doubting nothing. Don't worry, don't worry, I have sent them. And here, here, here's the clincher for me. Peter obeyed, even though he had a hesitation. Amen. 
He obeyed despite his hesitation, despite his worry, he obeyed. Go with this man. He had some hesitation, he had some worry, but he did it. Amen. Am I the only one that sees that? Am I the only one? Is that true? Is that a fair conclusion? Go with these men. Go down and, and, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter goes. Peter goes, even though it doesn't make sense. Listen to me. God never makes sense today. It took Peter walking in obedience. And then he came to verse 28 and finally he, he, he blurted it out and said, Now I see. Now it makes sense. But you see, back in verse 20, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense, but he obeyed. It didn't make sense, but he obeyed. He had some hesitation, but he obeyed. He obeyed. He obeyed. He obeyed. The Holy Spirit said to go, and Peter went with them. He finds Cornelius ready with his whole household to hear the gospel. And only then did it make sense. Verse 34, Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Peter didn't understand, but he obeyed. He went, he preached, they believed, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. They got saved, but before we got to that wonderful ending, Peter must be obedient. When God confronts our prejudice, it is important that we yield in obedience to him. Amen. It is important that we yield in obedience to him. Because there was another man in a city, in the same city of Joppa, who had prejudice in his heart. Does anyone know his name? There was another man in the city of Joppa. His name is Jonah. God sends him from that same city, go to a different city, Nineveh, and speak to your arch enemies, the Assyrians, so that they can what? Repent. What does Jonah do? Jonah heads, I think it's in the opposite direction, heads to Tarsus. We won't go into that story because of time. But let's contrast the obedience of Jonah, excuse me, the obedience of who? Peter with the disobedience of Jonah, the prophet Jonah. God confronted Jonah's prejudice, but instead of obeying, what did he do? He fled. He went to Tarsus. And so the point is, when God confronts our prejudices, let us respond in obedience. For when we do engage in partnership with the Holy Spirit, lives are changed and the church is strengthened. Lives are changed and the church is strengthened. I pray that God would help us as a congregation, help us individually. Because the truth is we come from different backgrounds. The truth is we have different upbringings. The truth is we even believe different things. But if we have a common faith in Jesus, then we must allow the Holy Spirit. In the words of Paul, we must preserve the unity of the Spirit. Despite our differences, despite our different backgrounds, despite our different beliefs, we must allow the Holy Spirit to deal with our prejudices and we must yield to him so that we can be in obedience to him, so that we can be effective in our service for him, and so that the church can be strengthened. As we close today, we've shared that we all have prejudice and that if we do not face our prejudices and allow God to root them out, we will find it difficult to accept people, right? Peter says, God accepts people. Did anybody catch that? Verse 35 of Acts chapter 10. In every nation, he accepts people 
He accepts those who fear him and do what is right. If we don't yield to God, then we run the danger of not accepting people whom God has accepted. May God help us. May he help us to accept people so that there's no barriers to fellowship and to effectively sharing the gospel. God showed Peter that he should not call anyone, not one person. He should not call anyone common or unclean. Our hearts should go out to every single person, whatever their ethnic origin or their background. We're not to write off anybody. We're not to snub anybody. We're not to check them out like the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan and then pass them by on the other side. It is my prayer today that the Holy Spirit would root out every prejudice that lurks in our hearts and break down walls of division in our congregation and that his name would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name. If you receive this word today in Jesus' name, would you say amen? Amen. Let's rise to our feet today. Let's rise to our feet today.